he was the light of our life musically. He filled our lives with such a lot. The conductor Constantine Silvestri came to Bournemouth, England as guest conductor for one week in 1961. He made such an impression on the orchestra players that general manager Ken Matchett followed the maestro to his home in Paris to sign him on as permanent conductor with the symphony. Matchett was willing to pay Silvestri whatever he asked for. It wasn't money that Silvestri demanded. It was time. He accepted the post only after Matchett assured the maestro that he could have enough rehearsals with the orchestra to mould them to his musical will. In Maestro Silvestri's eight short years with the orchestra, the orchestra went through a metamorphosis from players in a provincial band to orchestral performers lauded in and even beyond London. Under Silvestri's baton, the orchestra not only thrilled live audiences, but the performances reached thousands more through BBC radio broadcasts. Musical life changed under Silvestri. Along with the orchestra's phenomenal improvement came a demanding rehearsal and performance schedule, often requiring travel. Many orchestra members resigned. Those who stayed viewed him with a mix of emotions, respect, awe, fear, and a feeling of being part of a close musical family. The story of the transformation of the symphony under Constantine Silvestri is told from the perspective of Raymond Carpenter, who was the principal clarinet during Silvestri's tenure. By the time Maestro Silvestri arrived in Bournemouth, Ray had been with the orchestra for 13 years. Thus, our story begins with Ray Carpenter's early musical life. My mother told me when I was a small boy of seven, I used to play the mouth organ and used to play all the latest tunes outside their window. So they thought I must be very musical. <laughs> so uh, they sent me to a military school because my father was a military man and uh, he'd been in the army for 21 years. And because of that, I was able to have a free education at a military school in Dover. It was called the Duke of York's Royal Military School. From there, from the Duke of York's, I went into the Army Royal Artillery Band, which was quite a famous band, had a military band and an orchestra because we were all double-handed, you know what I mean? You played two instruments and I played three because I played the saxophone as well. So I was in the dance band. So I was triple, triple yammy whammied. I was signed up for nine and three, which means nine years on the, with the regular army and three years with the reserves. I joined in 1937, and in 1948, before I was due to finish, a colleague of mine, uh, his father worked in the Bournemouth Symphony Orchestra, and he said, would you like to come down 
uh, and spend the night, the day and the night with my family because we were great friends. And I said, would love to. And you can come to the orchestra and see them rehearse and perhaps go to a concert, which we did. And the orchestra said, well, we need a second clarinet. Would you like to join when you leave? And I said, well, I'll, I would like to join, yes, any time. When? I, uh, so they said, well, can, when can you get out? I said, well, if I came by Christmas, I'd have to buy myself out, which costs a hundred pounds in those days. So I said, I'll ask my mother. It was possible to get out of a military commitment early by paying a penalty. Orchestra openings, especially for the clarinet, didn't come around often. Ray appealed to his mother to pay the military. So I went to my mother and I said, look, I've got to get out of the army. She said, you haven't done all your time yet. And I said, I know, but if I can get out now, I can get into the Bournemouth Symphony Orchestra. So I said, come on, Mum, if I wait for another year, this opportunity will go and I may not get into another orchestra. So she said, all right. She said, I'll have to go into my, my savings account. She got out £100 and I paid it over here, got out, came down and I was in. Ray joined the orchestra in 1948. When he joined, Rudolf Schwarz was the conductor. Maestro Schwarz, an Austrian, started his conducting career in Germany, but in 1933 it was cut short. The Nazis dismissed him because he was Jewish. He was interned in Auschwitz, Sachsenhausen, and then Belsen. After World War II, Maestro Schwarz went to Sweden to recover from typhoid. Once recovered, he secured a position as conductor of the Bournemouth Municipal Orchestra, which was later to become the Bournemouth Symphony Orchestra. The switch from military band to orchestra was a welcome change for Ray Carpenter. They had instrument inspection every morning, and you had to remove all the dust. <laughs> and then it was fine. You could <laughs> you, your instrument was good for playing on then. Instead of having to do that, came down to Bournemouth, where everybody said... Oh, lovely to see you down here. They were so nice to me. I couldn't believe that people could be so nice to each other. Having come, you know, nine years in the army where they order you to do everything. When Ray joined the Bournemouth Symphony Orchestra, the principal clarinet was Hiram Lear, who was already close to retirement age. So I was second clarinet for four or five years. Then Hiram left. And Charles Groves was the conductor then. So before Hiram left, a month or two before, I thought, well, I better do something. Say, tell Sir Charles that I'm willing, if he wanted me, I would be prepared to take over. It was a bit of a nerve, really, to do that. But I steeled myself to it. So I knocked on his door. Come in. I went and he said, Raymond, what can I do for you? I said, well, uh, Mr. Groves, I, I know it's a bit of a nerve, but um, I just want you to know that if you can't find anybody else to do Hiram's job, I would be happy to take over if you thought I was good enough. And he was looking, he was writing. So he put his pen down and he looked at me and he said, Raymond, the job is yours. Silvestri, a Romanian, had success as a conductor, composer and pianist in his home country. A Scottish music critic visiting Romania was impressed by Silvestri's conducting. The critic's discovery opened doors for Silvestri's career. In January 1957, he took an engagement outside the Iron Curtain to give concerts in the Royal Albert and Royal Festival Halls. For the next several years, he guest conducted the major orchestras in the world. By the end of 1961, Silvestri had recordings through EMI with the French National Radio Orchestra, London Philharmonic, Paris Conservatoire, Philharmonia Orchestra and Vienna Philharmonic. He came and did a guest and we loved him. Of course, he was immediately recognised as a genius 
and he liked us because we were a very modest group. We weren't a big time orchestra, and he couldn't bear the big time players or orchestras. Didn't like their attitude. In his book Constantine Silvestri, Magician: A View from the Orchestra, Ray Carpenter described Silvestri as a phenomenon because he was able to transform an orchestra not from the best players, but from the lot he found in Bournemouth. Musicians of Ray's generation got their start in music through military bands and jazz bands. Many came to the orchestra not from conservatories, but from school bands or town orchestras. Violist Martin Costa admitted to Ray that he had never had a lesson on the viola. Silvestri sensed that the Bournemouth Symphony musicians were awestruck by his experience and were amenable to being shaped into better musicians. Ostensibly, Maestro Silvestri was a trainer. As such, he did everything possible to communicate to the orchestra the way in which he wanted them to play. Mr. Carpenter described Silvestri as a trainer who would sing, mime, stamp, and shout in the name of clear communication. Ray admits he was sometimes scared of Silvestri, as were many other orchestra members. Silvestri made rapid progress with the orchestra by choosing programs that matched the current level of the players and could help them master techniques that would allow the orchestra to take on new challenges. The orchestra often played technically difficult pieces in small towns, rather than the easier lollipop pieces that were more popular with rural audiences. This was Silvestri's way of pushing the orchestra and ensuring steady progress towards his loftier musical goals. He loved English music, but he'd never, I suppose, I, I'm only conjecturing here, but I doubt very much whether if he would, was to play a concert in Paris or or Stockholm or one of the, these centres of music, he wouldn't be asked to play English music because it it's not a special specialisation of his. He would he would do all the big continental. Big masterworks, that's what he specialised in. That's right, he had to um, do a, a recording with us of an overture called In the South from Alasio, it's called. And he did it for EMI. Why they asked him, nobody knows, but they did. It became, they said, one of the best recorded version of this overture ever put on disc. So that's something from a, from a Romanian.
Well, he got a love for Olga, and uh, we did the first uh, symphony. And usually with people like Sir Adrian Bolt, you know, Sir Adrian Bolt, a very well-known, distinguished conductor, the grand master in England of conductors, and other big conductors, English conductors, all did Elgar's first symphony because we were English, they knew how to do it. When Sylvester did it, we spent two or three weeks rehearsing it before we did it. I mean, he took it to pieces like a watchmaker, oiled it, cleaned it and oiled it and put it all back together again. And <laughs> it's a different piece. We thought we knew it, but we didn't. And now we did. Ray's wife, Cynthia, was a violinist. At the time of their first meeting, she was performing in an amateur orchestra. She would go on to join the Bournemouth Symphony Orchestra later. Ray was quite smitten with her the first time he saw her. With a bit of detective work, he pursued, wooed and married her. Cynthia Mitchell and Raymond Carpenter married in 1954. In the early days, I was a young man Lots of girlfriends and all that sort of thing. I met her at a, it was a coronation party. My girlfriend at the time had a big, her family was an architect, very, quite wealthy, had one of the first big television sets and invited all her young friends to come to watch it and, and have drinks and eats and all that sort of thing. And we all sat in a semicircle on the floor cushions and things and she was one end and I was the other end we were watching but gradually we were looking at each other so I thought what a charming young lady besides which she had a very low cut dress I remember and I thought wow that's something else so I decided that I would want to meet her and though my girlfriend was the one who invited everybody there at the time so secretly, naughty, 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 I made investigations and I found out how to contact her. And I learnt that she used to ride her cycle from work past the Lansdowne, which you've seen, the Lansdowne here, where the clock is. So I used to wait there. And uh, one day she rode along and uh, I said, hello. And she stopped, and of course that was the beginning of it. Cynthia had her sights set on joining the Bournemouth Symphony. Her violin teacher arranged for her to audition with Sir Charles Groves, the conductor of the symphony during that time. She was having lessons from the leader of the second violins uh, because he used to conduct their amateur orchestra. They had an amateur orchestra. And uh, so she said, is there any way I can get into the orchestra? because I would, it's what I would want to do. It's my big ambition. He said, oh, you'll have to play to Sir Charles Groves, who was the conductor at the time. She said, Cynthia said, well, what are you going to do about it? So eventually he spoke, this leader of the second violin spoke to Sir Charles. He said, I've got um, 
one of my pupils would like to play to you. Oh, oh, that's that's very interesting. You very rarely get that request. Well, bring her, bring her to my house one day. So they arranged an appointment. So he went, took took Cynthia along, and uh, Sir Charles said. Right, young lady, what are you going to play? Because he had no idea who she was, what she was capable of doing. So he picked out pieces for her to play, and she performed, and uh, he said, I'm very happy to have you in my orchestra. As soon as uh, the opportunity comes, I will phone. As we were an orchestra of many of them, very elderly people, one was sure to die at some time. And that happens. <laughs> it's terribly cruel, isn't it? One did die. And so he phoned her up and he said, would you like to come to the rehearsals starting on... Da, 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 da? And that's how she got in. When the Bournemouth Sinfonietta formed, Cynthia also performed with that group. The Sinfonietta travelled extensively, earning a reputation in its own right. With Cynthia... Ray had an ally during the Sylvestri years to share the musical achievements along with the tremendous strain of the heavy rehearsal and performance schedule. Cynthia appreciated Maestro Silvestri's matter with the orchestra. He used to call the orchestra his family. That's what he called his orchestra, his family. And so he knew everybody. And Cynthia was very conscious of this. And she said, he said, to me, she said, it's lovely because I feel as though I'm as important as you are. <laughs> and I said, well, you are. You've always been, in fact, as far as I'm concerned, you're more important. But she used to say, yes, but we never felt it in the orchestra. You know, when you're one of 14 players, like the first violins, there would be 14 players. Usually the conductor only speaks to the leader. But Silvestri spoke to them all. And uh, he would look at the back stands to make sure they were paying attention and speak to them and look at them so they knew. Uh, this happened all through the orchestra. He spoke to everybody, his family. Maestro Silvestri invited Ray Carpenter to his home to rehearse the Mozart clarinet concerto for which Ray was to be the soloist in an upcoming concert. This is my wife, Poopa. He used to call her Poopa. And Poopa will make some tea or coffee for us. Well, that never arrived. The whiskey bottle did, though. <laughs> and we all had whiskeys. And he said, let me hear you play the first eight, twelve bars. So I played them as I... Or always play. I've known the Mozart all my life, so I I could play it from memory quite easily. And he said, "That's fine. Put your instrument down. Now we'll have a drink." And he said, "Let us talk about." And so I never played another note. We talked about anything to do with, but that's all. And we, we were both a bit tipsy by the time he said, "Well, you better go home now. I expect you'll want to sleep. I do." Unfortunately, no recording exists of Ray performing the Mozart Concerto, although he had many opportunities to showcase his talent while performing other pieces, such as Pines of Rome.
although Silvestri is known primarily as a conductor, he did enjoy success as a composer. The Bournemouth Symphony recorded Silvestri's three pieces for strings. It is perhaps his side as a composer that kept him in tune with the modern music of his time. Stravinsky's Firebird was one of his favourites, even though it posed some technical challenges for the orchestra. Stravinsky was part of the modern scene. I mean, he, he did everybody. I mean, we've done a marvellous recording with him of the Firebird, music for the Firebird, uh, and not only uh, the four movements, or five movements, is it, uh, that we normally do, but he did uh, or incidental music from the, from the Firebird. Uh, and it was about nine or ten movements, all, all in all. Music is, you never hear. But he found it somewhere, and we recorded it. With the Firebird Suite, the introduction has got impossible things that he wrote. And you, you bluff. At least I do. You can't play it. You make an impression do fake fingerings and false fingerings, anything to get the conductor to accept what you're doing, <laughs> which we do many times as musicians. And I found that the introduction to the firebird was fine once I learned how to the, the different fingerings and so on. It was easy enough. Under Silvestri's baton, the Bournemouth Symphony became famous for performing Enescu's Romanian Rhapsody No. 1 as an encore. The piece begins with a duet of Ray Carpenter on clarinet and Roger Winfield on oboe. Silvestri had them start the piece on their own to the great delight of audiences. The Romanian Rhapsody was always an encore, so we would have played the piece. Great reception for whatever it was. And then Silvestri would go off and he said, now I will walk on, the applause is still going, and I shall stand there and look as though I want to say something. And the, the audience will stop clapping. And he said, I will look at you, and I'll give you a wink, and you start off, and I won't do anything. And just you and Roger Winfield will play your opening bits and I will walk on slowly, and by the time you get to the where I have to bring in all the orchestra's strings, I will 
then beyond the rostrum, just at the right time to pick up my baton and go, so And it was a gimmick, but it worked because the, the audience loved it. They, 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 they loved the theatre of it, you know, because it was him walking on slowly, not doing anything to us. We were just carrying on. turning point for the Bournemouth Symphony Orchestra was a performance of Tchaikovsky's Manford Symphony at the Royal Festival Hall in London, just 13 months after Silvestri became conductor. Manfred was not a piece on everybody's repertoire, in everybody's repertoire, certainly not London orchestras, and Manfred hadn't been performed in the Festival Hall for ages and ages. You know Manfred Symphony, Tchaikovsky, and it's a big, long, sprawling, it's over an hour long. And uh, not many conductors fancy doing it, to tell you the truth, because, you know, you, you've got to... <laughs> that means out of a, a concert of an hour and a half of music, that's an hour gone uh, of, of what you could do. And there were many more lollipop-type pieces that they could put in. Tchaikovsky, Manfred, is, is not an easy piece to play. Difficult, difficult for the orchestra, very difficult, and certainly difficult for the conductor.
a London Times review of the BSO performance said, The applause at the end was unusually long and lusty, deservedly so for the lightness and fitness of the strings in the waterfall scene, the expressively moulded wind solos, and the grand, vibrant, rather Frenchified sonority of the Bournemouth brass placed the orchestra in the top national class. Cynthia came in and she said, I've got something to tell you. I said, what's that? Sylvester's just died. You see, and I, I just froze. I, I just couldn't believe. I mean, he was the light of our life musically. He filled our lives with such a lot. retired from the symphony in 1987 and remained in Bournemouth with his family. He became the self-appointed archivist and champion of Constantine Silvestri's recordings. He helped to produce nine discs of Silvestri conducting the Bournemouth Symphony Orchestra. If it weren't for Ray, there would be very few with any recordings left of Silvestri and the BSO. The BBC recycled the originals of the broadcasts destroying all of the Bournemouth Symphony tapes. Silvestri's own off-the-air recordings were destined for a dustbin when Ray rescued them, along with Silvestri's extensive index of the tapes. Ray eventually found a home for the tapes in Wessex Film and Sound Archive in Winchester, where they now reside. Silvestri's memorial stone would not be in St. Peter's Churchyard today if it weren't for Ray. Ray raised the funds and provided all the documentation necessary to convince St. Peter's that Constantine Silvestri met the criteria to have a memorial in their churchyard. St. Peter's required Ray to prove that Silvestri was indeed a British subject and that he was of a Christian faith other than Catholic. Then, when the church put the memorial in an obscure corner, Ray lobbied to have it placed more prominently. Today, Silvestri's memorial resides next to Sir Dan Godfrey's, who founded the Bournemouth Municipal Orchestra in 1893. What about Raymond Carpenter? Ray continued to live life to the fullest until his death at the age of 95 on the 29th of October 2017.